Welcome to our second Technologies Education session. This week we're going to be exploring the content of the Technologies Learning Area and going into the more specifics about what students need to learn. So we're going to explore five different aspects. Um, the first is looking at the level descriptions and the achievement standards of what students will be expected to learn. Uh, the content descriptions, which describe in more detail the specifics of what students need to learn. And the elaborations, which represent um, ways in which students can address the content. Now, one very important thing that I'm going to mention a few times is that the elaborations represent examples. They are not an exclusive set of content that needs to be taught. Um, you can pick and choose from the elaborations. You can choose to ignore them completely and come up with your own approaches to addressing the content. They are simply examples to assist teachers in understanding what might be possible and different ways and approaches of going about teaching design and technology and digital technologies. And then finally, we're going to look at some scope and sequence examples of how we can structure all of this content uh, to help it help us as teachers make sense in planning programs of study for students and also help students give a summary of all the material that they're going to be learning. So let's get into it. First off, we're going to start with the level descriptions uh, for design and technology around the foundation year. So these represent what we want students to learn about design and technology in their very first year of compulsory schooling. So the key aspect of this is they need to be able to create at least one type of design solution for one of the contexts, or you can come up with your own context. Um, but essentially, uh, in your planning and how you structure what students need to be learning, you do need to allow them to have one opportunity to come up with some sort of solution to a problem. Now, in doing that, they need to design and produce it. Now, there's a couple of important aspects about that. First is design. They need to be involved in some aspect of creativity. They can't just be following your instructions or the instructions in a book or how to fold a paper plane or how to make a kite following some instructions. They need to be given some, at least minimal opportunities to make some decisions about the design. Um, and that can be challenging in the very early years. Of course, students aren't well practiced and much of the material will be um, guided by you or by other instructional material to help them with that process. But they need to be um, introduced to the concept of design, even if it's making some choices between some pretty obvious options, maybe choosing the size of a wheel that goes on a toy car. Um, and how that changes the properties of that toy car, depending upon the size of the wheel and how they might make different decisions around the size of the wheel, depending upon what the car is meant to do. Is it meant to be able to go over some bumps? Is it able to be go very fast or to go a long way? How does that choice of wheel size make an impact upon their design solution? OK, and they need to be able to produce something. Even if it is a, a toy car produced by adding different sized wheels to it, um, or a kite, or a catapult, or a simple computer game, or a web page. These are all things that you need to think through around your planning of your technologies units. In this case, we're focusing on designer technology. And we want to make it fun for them. In the very early years, most of the learning should be um, encompassed within what's called a play-based curriculum or play-based experiences. So they're having fun with these activities. They shouldn't be seen as purely academic. Um, they're making a toy car so that they can play with that toy car, making a kite so they can play with the kite, making a garden so they can go out and play in the, in the outdoors and grow their plants and have fun in the garden. Certainly we want them to learn things, um, but we want to make it 
that happen through a play-based curriculum. And we'll talk more about that, particularly next week when we explore pedagogy. And the solution that they design should have a purpose. Um, and ideally that purpose shouldn't just be because the teacher said to do it this way or the worksheet said to do this. They should actually understand that it has an actual purpose. Now, it may not be a real world purpose where people are going to use it and it's going to have a big dramatic impact upon society, but it should have some purpose, even if it's just a purpose for them to make their car go faster, to make the kite fly higher. Have a purpose in mind so that they can direct their decisions around their design solution towards achieving that purpose. Okay, they should also be developing an awareness of how people design products, that there is actually a process. Someone actually designs the things that they use. The bus that they come to school in was designed by somebody. They made decisions about where the seats should go, how fast the engine should be, all of these decisions that went into making a bus or making their chair or making the pen they use to write with. And as part of that, then they should be seeing that there are alternatives in that decision-making process. We could either have a, a pen that will write for a long, long time, that will be very large and heavy, or we have a pen that's nice and light, that will only have a certain amount of ink and will run out after a small amount of time. There were decisions made around that and coming up with the most suitable idea or solution from those range of different possibilities is a big part of technology's education. Okay, now as part of that design process, we also want students to be able to communicate their designs, to be able to draw them or write about them um, and ideally come up with models and uh, more structured drawings. One of the things you want to be able to have students understand is that they can depict their drawing from different perspectives. For example, a plan view, looking down upon their drawing, or a front view. And in later years, they'll explore other different types of views. So for example, uh, planning out a playground. They could do a plan view, looking down on the playground and where things would be placed, or they could do a front view, looking at how people are playing in the playground. And each of those different perspectives give different understandings about what's happening with their design in terms of the placement of different items, um, their shapes and their structures and the relationship they have to each other. And they need to learn about how to work with materials. They're going to work with a whole range of materials and understand that different materials are used for different purposes. We have cardboard and fabric and paper and our choice of making something, let's say a kite, will be determined by the properties of those materials. We could make a, a, a kite out of cardboard, but it might be too heavy. We might make it out of cloth, but that might flop around too much. We might make it out of paper, which is, can be made very uh, stiff using the um, frame, and that might provide the best um, design solution to the problem of having our kite fly in the air. And they'll also learn about how to use various tools such as scissors and glue and hot glue guns and trowels for digging in the garden and kitchen utensils. And these are all important skills that they'll go through. I'm um, using a hammer and nail, not hitting their fingers too often. Um, of course, the other important we want, thing we want them to be able to do is to use these tools safely. Now, young children being young children, they won't always think through the consequences of using tools. Fundamentally, they don't necessarily understand those consequences. Um, so how to use a hammer correctly and safely, how to use the scissors correctly and safely, how to use sticky tape correctly, how to use um, uh, paste, um, glue correctly and safely are all skills that students need to learn over time. Um, and they will cause a range of challenges in teaching. Okay. So in years one and two, they then move on to developing a range of different design solutions. And over that two year band, students should have the opportunity to create three different design solutions at a minimum. And they should address the two combined technologies concepts. In years one and two, we combine 
the four um, technologies contexts into two. Not exactly certain why, uh, because we call them the same, but we just put the first, oh, the, the first and the fourth one together, um, both relating to engineering, and the third, the second and the third one, both relating to food, um, into two. So, students should have opportunities to experience again designing and producing their products, and look at all the different rich connections that can be made around doing that with other learning areas, such as mathematics when they have to measure things, such as science when they have to understand various uh, scientific concepts, say if they're making kites, how to understand the principles of flight, gravity, um, weight, drag, resistance. These are all things that are important to understand when they're designing an engineered solution around a kite or understanding the, the properties of food um, and how where food comes from. In science, they learn about how plants grow and how the carbon cycle um, sucks carbon out of the air and infuses it within plants to build their structures and combined with nutrients and water, they produce nice flourishing plants. But from a um, design technology perspective, it's much more about how to place those plants in the correct location so that they receive sufficient water, they receive, receive sufficient sunlight, um, that the soil is aerated and um, provided with nutrients and all the rest. So different perspectives, but same activity addressing learning outcomes in multiple um, learning areas. Okay, so in years one and two, Again, students will be exploring and investigating various technologies and the tools and the materials that they'll be using, but they also need to start looking now at sustainability, how to make sure that their solutions are sustainable, that so that they don't impact negatively on the planet, uh, maybe so that they have minimal waste, maybe they're designing packaging so that it has minimal wastage or it's biodegradable. So through this, they're looking at the impact of their decisions. So when they come up with their design solutions, it's not just looking at how it solves a problem, but also potentially what problems it might produce. Okay, they also need to start evaluating their solutions. Has it actually achieved what it was intended to achieve? Did we produce it in the best possible way? Could we have produced it using fewer re resources, produce less mess and waste? Uh, could we have done it more quickly and efficiently? Could the group have worked better and more effectively? So they then need to think about their role in those processes, particularly if it was a group task. How did they contribute? Did they generate ideas and help with that? Did they support other people's ideas? Did they allow everyone to suggest ideas? Um, so these are skills that students develop over time through doing various technologies activities. Ideally, they should have started developing different perspectives. How to think about, say, if they're looking at transport. Um, what is it like for different people to arrive at school in different ways? Being dropped off in a car by their parents is one perspective. But did they gain a perspective of how people might, students might be dropped off on the bus? Or riding to school? Or walking to school? Or carpooling? These are all different um, experiences that unless students think about them and consider various approaches and ways of addressing the problem that they're exploring, they may not consider. And then they need to understand that they'll have certain personal preferences and other people will have preferences. And it's okay to have different preferences and different approaches. There's no necessarily one right approach and allowing other people to have explore their approaches is just as important as having their approach explored and accepted. Okay, all of that often involves communication and students will develop their ability to communicate their ideas and explain them. Explaining how they're going to build a tower using Lego bricks to make it a, a very cool tower. What bricks are they going to use? How large is the base going to be? How are they going to strengthen things as it rises up so that it doesn't fall over? 
and they need to explore those ideas and explain them. And often we'll use drawings and models to help it with that explanatory process. And again, in um, years one and two, they should be doing two dimensional images from different viewpoints. They need to plan out the steps, follow directions and manage their own roles in projects to achieve these tasks. And think about those different um, aspects that they're going through a planning process for a purpose. It's not just because the teacher told them to. It's so that they come up with a better design or they look at a range of different possibilities before they choose which of them they then um, try to implement. That they can follow directions, either the directions of their group, the directions of their teacher, of instruction manuals and various other approaches that may give them assistance in coming up with their solutions. And of course, we want them to be able to work safely, but also cooperatively. How to work in teams is a taught skill. And we need to help um, prepare students to be able to work in teams effectively. OK, then we come to years five and six. At this stage, again, students should be developing at least three design solutions across that two year band and addressing now three different technologies contexts where we break apart the engineering context and look at those separately, but keep the food and fiber and food specialization context together as one. Oops. Again, of course, need to have opportunities for designing and producing and looking at the different rich connections that can be achieved with other learning areas. Investigating various tools and technologies, but now starting to look at how they are addressed within various contexts. So not just in their own home and their local school, but how their solutions might have an impact or be useful for their local community or for the Australian community or for regional groups, say for Queensland or for um, Outback Australia. And then also starting to think about things globally. How would their solution work in Africa or in Europe? And as they start having this broader perspective, starting to think more about how their solutions will impact society and the ethics around some of their decisions and the effect that they'll have on their environment. And we'll explore some of those in a bit more detail. They need to be thinking about why and for whom these technologies are developed. We don't create solutions normally just on a whim. We create them for some purpose, for somebody, and they'll have certain needs. So it's not necessarily that we're creating them for ourselves or for what we think the solution should be, but we need to find out what other people need the solution to actually achieve. And that often involves talking to various um, stakeholders or uh, what we call user groups and building up stories about what they are going to need in terms of the solution. And they need to start developing ideas beyond the familiar ideas. In F to 4, most of the things students will do will be familiar to them. But now we start need to be introducing quite unfamiliar concepts such as um, water scarcity. Well, if they're in Outback Australia, probably not so much of an issue, and they'll be quite familiar with that. But in many other parts of Australia, um, we don't necessarily have water scarcity. But in much of the world, they don't have access to fresh water. And it's a really significant problem. Um, there's issues of women and have, having access in terms of equal opportunities. Now, certainly in Australia, we still have some way to go there, of course, but in many other parts of the world, that's much more of a significant issue, even down into primary years of schooling. So these are some issues that students can start exploring and then developing solutions to. And we'll explore all these range of possibilities um, in future sessions. And then they also need to start looking at the occupations that people involved in technologies um, go on to uh, have as their careers. Being science, well, 
scientists, of course, but we also have engineers, we have farmers, we have technologists in a whole range of different um, fields and exploring these different um, opportunities for careers is an important aspect, but also just to understand that there are a wide range of different people in our society that utilize technologies and design and technology and engineering and food production and fiber production. And having a better understanding of that allows students to have a better understanding of society as a whole. So in terms of years five and six, we want to start students now starting to be innovative and exploring different innovations, different ways people have come up with new ways of doing things. And often we look at historical innovations and um, the inventors that have come out of Australia and inventors happened overseas. We could look at the Wright brothers and the um, development of the first aeroplane. But the idea that people come up with new approaches, they develop innovative approaches to doing things. And these are often provide new opportunities. Um, different ways of doing things provide different opportunities in society. Uh, different ways of growing um, plants, um, say different irrigation processes, now provide new opportunities for farming in areas that in the past weren't suitable for farming. Um, we could look at hydroponics, for example, as a good um, one for that, where um, Israel, for example, has got a large areas of their desert now being used for farming um, in enclosed hydroponic gardens. And as part of that, students should be exploring what the future could be like as a result of these innovations. How could we use hydroponics across Australia to grow food in the desert? How could we make dams in Northern Australia to capture water during the monsoon season so that it can be released over the year to irrigate uh, vast areas during the dry seasons. These are things that students can think through as they imagine what the future could be like with various technological innovations. And this then leads them towards trying to achieve their preferred future, the world that they would like to see come about for themselves and for their descendants. And of course, students will be using a range of different technologies and tools and um, graphically representing these in a wider range, often using computer-based um, CAD systems, um, to creating various models and storyboards showing how things uh, change over time, using thumbnail sketches to draw different aspects of their solutions, creating models and diagrams and um, the rest of the different opportunities to communicate their ideas. They should now also be labeling and annotating and producing sequence sketches, showing how their design will be developed in stages and labeling that and showing various aspects and using drawing symbols um, to represent various things, putting in scales, putting in directions, um, say a, um, a compass to show up on a plan where north is positioned. Um, so expanding out their use of various techniques to communicate ideas about their design solutions or their plans for a design solution. And of course, they need to be working increasingly in groups. Um, and at this stage, negotiating things more. So not just being told, um, for example, what the criteria for a task will be for a project, but actually coming up with criteria on their own, negotiating with the teacher what the criteria will be for the success of their solution. Now, that's a challenge for many teachers who are used to setting criteria and setting the outcomes of what students should be achieving. But by years five and six, students should be having a say in those processes, building the capacity for themselves to be able to set criteria, to think through what is it going to mean for this to be successful in terms of, of an outcome. Now, that's a skill that needs to be taught. And if teachers only ever do that for students, um, they don't get an opportunity to learn that themselves. They need to be able to follow plans and complete design tasks safely, but they also now do need to be able to adjust those. So even if a teacher gives them instructions, say on how to bake a cake, 
students should be thinking through, okay, how could we change that? How could we make that better? Now that can be very audacious, but it's part of the design process. And as we're going to explore next week in particular, looking at the pedagogy of failure, we want students to make mistakes. Students learn a lot from making mistakes. So allowing them to deviate from known solutions and known ways of doing things, to come up with their own ways of doing things, even when we know they're going to make mistakes in doing that. It's a learning process. We're not teaching students how to bake cakes because we all want them to go off and become um, pastry chefs. We're teaching them so that they learn how to design things, how to make things, how to create things. And to do that, they need to be allowed to make mistakes. That's a big challenge for many teachers. But of course, we still need them to be able to work safely. But by years five and six, we want to place more of that responsibility on students. Yes, of course, as a teacher, as the adult in the room, you have the ultimate responsibility for safety of your students. Absolutely. But you want students to have some responsibility in that. Even though you have the ultimate responsibility and ultimate say, and you'll step in if there's any danger possibly occurring. But your students should be able to come up with their own ways of keeping things safe their own standards, what they expect their group to do, how they expect to use the hot glue gun, how they expect to move things around safely and um, efficiently in the workroom and so forth. Now, that again, of course, needs to be taught and learnt. They can't just jump straight in there and you allow them to make all the decisions because they will be unsafe. Um, by very definition, they are learning, they will make mistakes. So you need to do that in a quite a controlled, guided environment. But you still want to allow students to be able to make those decisions. OK, now we come to what are called the achievement standards. These are what students need to be able to demonstrate by the end of the year bands. So by the end of year six, these are the achievement standards that students need to be able to show that they have demonstrated. Now, we don't just collect all the data at the end of year six. Um, often we'll be collecting evidence of how they can achieve these things from the beginning of year five. Um, and we build portfolios of evidence and um, we have that. But by the end of year six, it is expected that students will be able to do these things. Because the teachers in year seven will be assuming that their students coming in can do these. And if they can't, that then messes up all of their le learning activities. Just as students coming into your class in grade six, or say grade five, you'll have expected them to be able to have demonstrate the things that the curriculum says they should be able to demonstrate by the end of year four. Doesn't always work that way, of course, but that's the ideal. So by the end of year six, students should be able to explain how people design products, services, and environments that meet the needs of communities and are sustainable. Uh, for each of the three uh, technologies contexts, remember we had the two engineering ones and the food and fiber and food technologies ones combined for years five and six, they need to be able to explain the features of technology's impacts upon design decisions and how they can create design solutions for those different contexts. They need to be able to process data and show how digital systems represent data and design algorithms involving complex branching and iteration. Now, remember, this is for the learning area. This is not just design and technology now. This is for the whole of the learning area. Um, they need to be able to implement uh, programs using visual programming languages. And you're going to be exploring one of those um, in the tutorial this week. They're going to be able to select and justify their design ideas and develop solutions against design criteria. They'll, of course, be able to communicate their ideas and content to an audience. This is important. The audience bit is important. It's not just um, doing it because it's part of the assignment, and it's not just necessarily communicating it to you as a teacher, although you could be the audience. Uh, but ideally, it should be against a particular audience. Ideally, the people that are going to be using their solution or having their solution um, impact upon them. They need to be able to develop plans and select technologies and techniques that safety produce. Um, 
in digital technologies, they need to be able to securely access uh, various systems and to pro process and transmit data um, using various communication technologies. They also need to have an understanding of their digital footprint and recognize its permanence. Now, these are things that we'll explore in more detail in the subject um, standards, but these provide an overview of the standards. Uh, they need to meet the needs of communities, including sustainability and their three design contexts. Oops. So I'm jumping now to years one and two. Um, three and four is sort of in between. So it's pretty much the same. But of course, I don't want to go on for too many hours in this session. Um, we're going to skip some of the sections. So in the earlier years, in years one and two, they again need to be producing a familiar, or they need to be able to describe the purposes of familiar products, services, and environments, um, including use of digital systems. Different ways that these um, things can be addressed. So there's not just one possible product or service or environment, but there could be a range of different. And we have a process of choosing amongst those and developing um, different ones, depending upon different needs. They need to be able to develop basic algorithms and meet the needs of known users. So this is different to um, different audiences. Now we're creating solutions for particular people. So it might be for the tuck shop lady so that she can better wrap up um, the sandwiches. So rather than in years five and six, where it would be for a particular um, group of people or a particular audience, say it might be for the local community to reduce waste by putting bins around the local community. Um, in years one and two, we pick a particular person or particular specific um, element that we develop a solution for. Um, and years one and two, we reduce down to just the two contexts um, and simplify what they are trying to address, where they're looking at the main features and uses of the technologies and creating solutions rather than the broader elements that we looked at in years five and six. And of course, they're fairly familiar to you. Oops. Okay, so now we're going to look at a particular subject, design and technology. So we looked at the, the um, learning area. Now we look specifically at the subject, very, very similar, of course. Um, two of the prescribed contexts are looking at the features and uses and creating design solutions. Looking at things based upon their personal preferences. Now, in high school, they'll be looking at um, their designs based on a lot of other criteria. But in primary school, generally students will be expected to make their decisions based upon what they want. Um, now, they need to be considering what others um, need, but it's very much based upon their personal preferences. But of course, they need to be able to communicate these ideas to others and produce them and so forth. And then let's look at the foundation year. So by the end of the foundation year, in the learning area as a whole, um, there's only very specific things we want students to be able to achieve. So identifying familiar product services and environments. So what is a design solution? What is something that we could design? Uh, could be a television, could be a bike, but just being able to identify things and using them for a purpose. So understanding that we don't just use them as toys or um, play things, but they actually have a purpose. They have something that we have designed them to do. And again, the similar things, communicating and doing things safely. Oops. And so forth. So that just sets the outcomes of what students should be able to do in general at the different year bands. And you'll find these in the curriculum documents. 
Now we're going to look at the content descriptors. These represent specific things that we want to make sure students can demonstrate. Um, and they are described quite specifically. So there are a range of them. Um, they have Each of them have a code. As you'll see, this one is AC no Australian Curriculum version 9. Technologies. Um, <laughs> I think it might be design. Um, and then we have foundation um, and item 01. So all those codes mean something that essentially this is the first of the content descriptors for the aspect of technologies and society. And students need to be able to demonstrate that they can explore familiar product services, environments. So how familiar product services and environments are designed for people. Now, that's a little bit obscure. So you may not be quite sure how to go about doing that. So we provide what are called, well, first off, we provide some related context, or sorry, related content. In geography, students will also be exploring how familiar places um, belong to particular um, contexts. Um, so um, students understand that uh, they have a relationship to their home. They have a relationship to their school. They have a relationship to the local shops. Um, and there is some responsibility to look after those. So that's sort of what they'll be learning in geography. Oops. And then we have what are called elaborations. These are ways that are suggested to go about teaching students about how to explore familiar, how familiar products, services, and environments are designed by people. Um, now, they are not prescriptive. You don't have to do them. And you can choose from them. You don't certainly have to do them all. That would be way too much. Um, and you can come up with your own ways of addressing it as well. They are there to give you ideas. So first one here is um, looking at how First Nations Australians have designed and produced domestic items, including clothing, tools, and shelters. So looking at how Aborigines have made different items of clothing or various tools or various shelters. And of course, this links in with opportunity to develop not only critical and creative thinking, but also Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures. So again, we're looking at familiar products and that they're designed by people, but we could also be looking at how uh, the familiar product we might have at home in terms of a house might be different for other people. Um, how Aboriginals may have made different shelters, how um, uh, Native Indian Americans, Native Americans um, may have built uh, teepees. So different approaches to creating products that students are familiar with. But the idea is that they have been designed by someone. Another approach might be looking at delivery services, how we get packages, um, how we receive things. If I want to send a a gift to my grandmother. What happens? How does it get there? Um, how does online shopping work? Um, these are things that can be explored. Um, looking at local playgrounds, how we could create shade structures to make uh, playgrounds safer um, so that we could play in the hot sun. So these are again just examples of approaches you could use for teaching students this particular content descriptor. Um, looking at community gardens or swimming pools and how they've been designed to be safe and to keep people healthy and active. Uh, looking at packaging and how we could design different packaging so that it um, attracts attention, so that we'll buy a product, but also so that it might be reusable or reduce waste. Um, and again, critical thinking opportunities. So the next foundation one is around designing and making. How to generate, communicate, and evaluate design ideas and use materials, equipment, and steps to safely make a solution for a purpose. So we again have some, whoops. No related content for that one. Um, so some elaborations. 
some ways of doing it. Um, in this case, if sand keeps blowing into the sand pit, or out of the sand pit, probably more likely, or uh, the birds keep flying into the waste bin and taking food out, um, or students with disabilities not knowing where they could park in the school so that they could have easy access to various locations. These could all be ways that we could come up with different um, solutions to these various problems. Uh, drawing and modeling um, different ideas. Uh, for example, creating a, a bee hotel so that bees can uh, come to the garden more often and pollinate the various plants. So how they could design a bee hotel and how they would then draw that from different perspectives and plan it out in terms of their drawing. Um, evaluating the different choices they've made. So if, for example, going around and um, surveying students in the school, um, for example, what they might like to have sold in the uh, school canteen. Um, and they could use what's called a Likert scale where they could choose different smiley faces or frown, frowny faces and how that represents different things that they could be making a choice between. Other examples using various blocks to, and construction material to make rain gutters or a ramp to roll a, a ball or a toy car down. Um, so all of these are approaches for generating, communicating and evaluating design ideas using materials and equipment and steps to safely make a solution for a purpose. So they're activities. A few others, um, looking at different materials, for example, to make um, something to keep seedlings warm or a structure, a trellis to uh, hold up tomato plants and the various tools and materials that will be needed to do that. Assembling components of systems and checking that they work together. For example, making a bowling game or a stacking game or an obstacle game using various packaging material. Okay, so take a little bit of a break. That's giving you a bit of an overview of the content of the curriculum. Um, some of the theoretical elements describing the um, outcomes that we want to see students achieve by the end of various year bands, and then starting to look at some of the content descriptors and elaborations that delve into the activities that you'll do with students that will help achieve those um, learning outcomes that we want students to be able to accomplish. And I'll see you in a few minutes as we come back and start looking at some of the other uh, content descriptors. Well, welcome back. Now we're going to look at content descriptors for years five and six. So we looked at the earlier years. Now we're going to look at the um, upper end of primary in design and technology. So first off again, as we know in the design technologies curriculum, we start by looking at the technologies in society. And the first of those content descriptors in this is explaining how people in design technologies occupations consider competing factors, including sustainability, when they design product services and environments. So how we actually look at various design and technology related jobs. So being a farmer or an engineer or a miner, um, various professions that involve um, coming up with solutions related to design and technology and the various decisions they need to make about um, the challenges they face so that they come up with effective solutions that are also sustainable. Okay, so first elaboration um, possibility idea is again looking at First Nations Australians and looking at the different decisions they needed to make around catching food. For example, um, using fish traps or using fish poisons um, and how they went about um, achieving sustainable practices uh, compared to um, non-sustainable or non-selective harvesting, where we, for example, use um, trawling nets and catch a lot of different um, marine animals and then only choose a few to keep and then sell. And the others are either hopefully released or discarded and, and destroyed through that process. 
um, looking at the impact of different um, design solutions, for example, recycling materials, um, looking at different plastic tags and bottle pops um, and turning those into artificial limbs. Um, so again, focusing on that sustainability and the implications of various decisions. Looking at the aesthetics and the function and the sustainability of their designs. Does it actually look like a good design? Will people want to use it? Um, does it actually work? Does it function as it should and the most efficiently? And is it again sustainable? Um, so for example, looking at different clothing textiles, um, do they give ultraviolet protection? Are they appealing? Um, are you designing a new sports hat? Are students going to want to wear it or does it look ugly? Um, does it actually work? Does it keep the ultraviolet light out? Um, does it fall off? Does it, is it, is it um, designed effectively for the uh, running around in the outside that will be involved? Um, if it, there's strong wind, will that blow it off? Um, if it rains, does it get all soggy and floppy? These are all things that students could consider as part of a design solution around that particular challenge. Um, looking at risk and failure. Uh, so, for example, coming up with a new way of providing a notification to everyone in the school. Um, so let's say if we had to have a way of telling everyone that there was a bushfire coming, um, what would be the most effective way of doing that? What would be the consequences if one of the classrooms down the other end of the school didn't hear about that and didn't evacuate? Um, and they could try out different approaches and possibly even test them out. Uh, they could try ringing bells, and sounding alarms, uh, sending up smoke signals. Uh, they could come up with a range of different possible solutions and then explore how effective they may be, but then consider what will be the consequences if it's not effective. Looking at all the competing factors that people have to make in coming up with their decisions around their solutions. Um, and different ways we can learn from things. So looking at what's called biomimicry or how different animals have evolved to do different things has been very useful in the field of robotics, where we have some robots that have legs and some have, well, we don't have many animals that have wheels, but um, some robots uh, move through the water like a fish by um, moving their rear. Um, some fly, uh, some can step over objects, some need to um, change shape and morph into different um, orientations to be able to do different functions. And we've been able to look at different insects in particular, but also other animals and create robots that can do different things because we've learned how different animals have done different things. Okay, again, looking at things from a safety perspective um, and looking at how we can come up with solutions to keep people safe. So maybe coming up with different items of clothing that provide various warnings or um, other um, objects around the school that can provide notification of when something is going to be unsafe. Okay, so that was technologies in society. Then we have engineering principles and systems. So remember for years five and six, we have the three contexts, engineering principles and systems, food and fiber and food technologies, and then engineering, um, oh, we'll get to that one. <laughs> okay, so first of the ones in engineering principles and systems is explaining how electrical energy can be transformed into movement, sound or light in a product or a system. Again, we might be unsure about how to go about that. But oh, first off, it has a, some good parallels with science, where they're also often learning about um, electrical circuits at this point in their curriculum. Um, but from an engineering principles uh, perspective, looking at how we might make labor-saving devices using photovoltaics. So um, these are things where we can uh, say have solar charges or detect sunlight. So for example, we might have a, a gate set up so that when it's light, the gate is open and the animals can come in and out. 
that when it becomes dark, the gate closes. Um, we could also look at how um, First Nations Australians are developing aquacultures in coastal regions in Northern Australia. And again, how they're using some of these technologies to feed the uh, fish in these aquaculture, um, these fish farms. And we want them to be fed at certain times. So again, they use photovoltaics, so they detect when there's a certain level of light, and then they release the food pellets um, at that time. And so they don't release them at other times. Looking at how solar panels can assist in various um, communities to provide electricity. Um, looking at how we can use different types of light globes and switches. So a uh, common one I used to do with my students, they would develop a doll's house. And as part of that, they would put in lights into each of the rooms and also often a fan um, and sometimes a doorbell and so forth. And they would wire it up as an electrical circuit. And the idea was to look at the most efficient way of setting up the lighting so that all the rooms were well lit. Um, and for the fan, we used temperature sensors to measure the different heat in the different rooms. Uh, so again, using designer technology ideas and contexts, uh, but also strongly related to science and electronics, where they would be doing similar learning outcomes and would also benefit by developing the circuits. Uh, creating models, so in this example, how to control movement using sound, or sorry, how to control things using uh, movement, sound, or light. So, for example, having a lifting system that um, lifts a toy up, so a toy car, so that it can go up and then go down a track. Um, we might use a, a motor that would then lift that up. Or we might use a very large lever, so maybe it's a very heavy thing, and by using a, a large lever, or we could create a pulley system so they could use pulleys to make it easier to lift something um, using various mechanical concepts. Okay, again, coming back to electronics, using um, understanding how a torch or a buzzer works by looking at the circuits and then looking at how maybe that could be improved upon. So maybe making a torch brighter by improving the reflective surface, so the reflector. Um, putting some alfoil in or maybe polishing it up so that it's brighter um, and making it a better system in that respect. Okay, then we have food and fiber production and food specializations. And in this one, they need to explain how and why food and fiber are produced in managed environments. So a managed environment is something like a farm. Um, so it's not a completely man-made environment, which would be something like hydroponics. And it's not a natural environment, which would be like a national park. Uh, a managed environment is something that we actively manage, uh, but it's still part of nature. So a few elaboration ideas and examples. Um, looking at before colonization, um, uh, First Nation Australians had discrete communities that cared for and protected different areas and harvested different types of natural foods. Um, and had some plantations such as bunya nuts and macadamia nuts and finger limes and things of that nature. Looking at the different tools that will be used in doing these things, such as um, preparing soil and the effect on soil of um, that sort of preparation, uh, providing nutrients and making a, we often uh, have school gardens. Most primary schools now have a school garden that are used for these activities. Looking at the relationships between different animals and plants and how we can have some animals feed on different plants and improve their productivity in terms of um, growing more healthy. Um, but also how animals can provide manure for, for plants and um, the nutrients into the soil in that way. Looking at how we can sequence various processes um, uh, for on-farm food and fiber production so that it can be made suitable for sale. So how we can clean it, how we can process it, how we can package it, how we can transport it. Um, these are a range of different processes called the paddock to plate supply chain. 
or the fiber to garment life cycle. Um, and students understanding those so that they have an, a much deeper understanding of where their food and their clothing comes from. You could visit a farm and participate or participate in a virtual tour of a farm and ask questions and investigate how different things are made and produced and, and how the different farm workers do different jobs. Okay, and also a part of food and fire production, we have a focus on the food specializations, which is primarily focused around um, healthy eating habits and the characteristics of food that make them healthy. So they could again investigate First Nation diets and the nutritional value they gain from various um, items and how they addressed food spoilage and preparation and so forth. Whoops. Um, looking at various tools and equipment and ingredients, they could make various food items and look at the nutritional value of those. They can make various selections, um, look at different ways of preserving food, such as drying it, fermenting it, and sun drying and versus air drying and pickling um, so that it doesn't spoil. Looking at how different tastes are achieved by different foods how we have things that are salty and sour and sweet and spicy, um, and how different countries around the world have utilized um, different proportions and tastes around those to create different cuisines. Um, doing surveys of, his, of the classmates in terms of their eating habits, using creating some data um, and looking at how different choices have been made um, and how healthy those choices are. Looking at the different food service options um, where we can go out to eat at a cafe or a restaurant or a fast food location or takeaway and how that might affect the nutritional value of the food, certainly the cost value, um, and how we can also prepare food at home in various ways and how that can be made more nutritional and effective and cost effective. Okay, and the last one in design technology for years five and six is materials technology specialization. So again, looking at the properties of different materials, um, the systems that they're involved in and the components and tools and equipment and how they can all affect their use when we come to design different solutions. So again, looking at First Nations, looking at how they used various understandings of various materials, such as um, string and rope fibers um, and using them in different wet and dry and fresh water and salt water applications for fishing and, and so forth. Um, harvesting water um, and reducing energy consumption by creating different solutions around their home, uh, maybe creating some water tanks or um, reducing electricity consumption by using um, low energy light bulbs turning off things when they're not in use, measuring their electricity home consumption by um, looking at the power meter and seeing what's being done there. If they have a solar system, looking at what's being collected by the solar panels and uh, put back into the electricity system or used within the home. Looking at all the different materials that we have available and how we can um, look at ways we can recycle and reuse those. Um, for example, um, going to a water, wastewater treatment plant and looking at how we recycle um, sewage water so that it can be reused. Um, how we can recycle um, waste garbage and it can be reused in various ways. Or creating artworks out of um, found materials. Or how we can have various community groups that collect and utilize various um, no longer needed materials for either making it available to um, uh, the homeless, for example, and things of that nature. Okay, another one, uh, looking at various um, enterprises, creating um, homemade items, say for a, a school fete, uh, creating cupcakes to sell at their fete or local um, garments, um, say hats or various other trinkets and things that their students could put together and make as part of 
their designer technology learning. And again, looking at how other countries do things, looking at how we create different services and products um, in Australia versus how they might be done in Indonesia, for example, how we may use different public shelters for, um, say, our bus systems, how they differ in different countries. And again, looking at different fibres and the properties they have in terms of their uses, how they keep us warm or keep the um, keep us dry, um, allow us to breathe easily if in hot weather, so that the we have good air circulation. How they absorb odor. These are all properties that students could explore around different fibers in coming up with different solutions. For example, a t-shirt. And then we have another investigating and designing. So now we have the processes. So the first were the context and the technologies and society. Now we have our design cycle going through the various steps in creating solutions. And the first of these is investigating and defining. So investigating the needs and opportunities and so forth and the various materials that they're going to be able to use and a range of different um, elaborations again are provided for you to come up with idea. So in this case, um, creating biodegradable string or rope. Uh, looking at coming up for product for a security system for the local garden so that we don't have uh, people stealing the, um, the oranges that are being produced or maybe detecting when birds are attacking the various fruit and vegetables and coming up with some sort of system to scare away the birds. Uh, looking at various um, options for small space gardening, um, say for gardens in the classrooms themselves, how we could make window gardens um, or hydroponic gardens and various coming up with various possible solutions in that respect. So again, this one looking at ways of um, cleaning things using a robotic weeder or vacuum cleaner to keep spaces clean and tidy. Coming up with various um, ways of moving things, in this case, such as a, a rubber band powered vehicle um, or protective clothing. So looking at all the different materials and processes involved in creating something for a purpose. Minimizing waste, again, is a very common theme you'll find in technologies learning area. Making healthy soup versus takeaway soup. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Then we need to generate and design our solutions, coming up for a range of possible solutions to the different problems that we've been able to identify. Um, so exploring a range of different ways of addressing um, a problem. So again, looking at a whole range of different ways of having security systems or permaculture vegetable items or different meals we could have on a picnic. These are all different um, they're challenges that provide opportunities for students to explore a range of solutions. So coming up with five different packages for a, a family picnic and then comparing them, which is going to be best, which is going to um, be the lightest if we're going to have to travel a long distance, if we're going to have to, have to go through um, high temperatures, what's going to be the best selection of items for our picnic so that when we have our meals, they're not all hot and unapp unappetizing. Which ones will look good when we get there and we lay them out? Which are going to be most susceptible to be eaten by ants or attacked by birds? Uh, if we have to sit on the ground, which are going to be the best in that circumstance? Or if we're going to have picnic tables, which are best there? These are all decisions that students can make around different um, design solutions. Okay, a few more. Um, analyzing various recycling processes um, and coming up with the best ideas around those, uh, communicating their ideas in different ways, saying if they have to present their idea, what are the best ways of doing that? Is a PowerPoint presentation going to be a good way? Is creating a, a little model going to be the best way? Is creating a range of different posters going to be the best way of presenting their idea? Creating different diagrams. Um, and these are again things that students can think through and make considered decisions around. 
And again, looking at different ways of modeling their ideas. And in some ways, we can actually make computerized models. So we can actually have animations and show little simulations of how our potential solutions could work. Looking at all the different materials and processes that are going to be used um, and making choices around those, different ways of joining things together using glue or staples or various other mechanisms um, and so forth. Students might make different types of pop-up books using different um, approaches, different types of fabric bags using different types of materials or electrical circuits using different layouts and structures. And then of course we need to consider the implications of different solutions. Um, how it's, is it going to impact upon others? Is it going to be respectful of different cultures, different intellectual properties? These are things that students can explore and learn about. Then we actually make the products. So we've come up with ideas, we've designed a whole range of different possible solutions. Now we choose one of those and we make it. We need to make it safely, of course. And um, there are a range of different opportunities to do this. So again here, making some sort of banner, large community banner. How are we going to join all these different elements of the banner together? How is it going to cope in different aspects of the wind? How are we going to be able to make it strong enough? Making sure we do it safely. Are we wearing the right equipment? Are we wearing goggles? Are we wearing clothing that's going to be ensure that we're safe? Um, is it going to make too much mess? Are we doing things in a way that is safe in terms of um, the type of solution we're coming up with. Is it involved with water risks, risk of drowning? If we are in that, are we making something that's going to make things safer? Are we making some sort of flotation device or some sort of clothing that's going to make um, the user safer? Of course, we need to use our materials safely and so forth, particularly um, when it comes to food, food preparation. So making sure things are clean, we wash our hands, we wash our surfaces, we don't cross-contaminate items, but that also has to do with things to do with hot glue guns, um, how we where we lay them down, where we change the glue, where we don't ever touch the, the end, um, where we test it by putting it in, doing different things, but not using our fingers to test to see if it's hot. These are things that students need to learn about. Likewise, when using electricity, um, most of the stuff we tend to use with batteries, but sometimes there is still the potential for electrical shock. And we need to learn those processes, particularly when we need to have students understand that while we may be doing things with electrical circuits using batteries, AC power pre presents a much greater risk and students need to learn that. Then we look at the work practices um, and so they understand, again, the different ways of doing things, disposing things, um, cleaning up as we go, uh, making sure that we don't leave mess around that can uh, produce um, hazards, but also just to make things more efficient. Um, packing things up at the end, making sure everything goes back in their right places. Um, all of these things that students need can learn about and explore. Then, um, then we have evaluation. So once we have a solution, we now need to make some decisions as to how effective that solution has been. Did it meet the criteria that we set down? or was provided by our teacher or provided by our clients? Um, was it sustainable? Did it meet the achieve the design ideas? Did it go through the process that we thought we would go through? Did we work in a team as effectively as we would? So again, some things that we could explore as um, approaches to teaching students about this, having students come up with their design criteria and collaboratively come up with ways of measuring whether or not it is going to be a good effective design. Um, looking at the use of different materials and equipment and some sort of criteria that students could come up with um, around the sustainability of that. How much plastic are we using? How much paper are we using? How much metal are we using? Which is the best to use? Which is going to be most durable? Which is going to be need to be replaced more often? These are all things that they could consider in their evaluation. Um, iterating their design, going through it more than once so that they can improve upon their design based on their evaluation. Evaluation is all well and good, but unless students have an opportunity to make changes based upon the evaluation, 
it is all a little hollow. So wherever possible, we want students to be able to then, once they've evaluated, to go back and see what would happen if they put in place these suggestions that they've made in their evaluation as to how things could be done better. And again, looking at the benefits versus the costs, weighing up different options. This again is something students need to learn about. Um, yes, it may use less plastic, but it may only last one or two uses. Whereas if they made it out of plastic, it might last a hundred uses. And so in the long run, be much, much less impactful upon the environment. So these are things that students need to be able to consider. Again, a lot of it comes down to allowing students to make judgments and decisions about things. So how well it's going to meet criteria, students need to be able to be involved in making the judgment as to how well it's met the criteria. It shouldn't just be an assessment process where the teacher makes those decisions. Allow students to do so. Now, it may be through peer assessment where they can make assessment decisions upon each other. There is self-assessment where students can self-assess how they feel they have achieved in various criteria. So there are ways of allowing students to be involved in the evaluation process authentically. Then we have collaborating and managing. How well they've worked together to develop project plans that include consideration of resources and individually and collaboratively made design solutions. Um, have they set milestones? Have they met those milestones? Was anyone keeping track of time? Did anyone set timeframes for when different things had to be achieved? Did they break up the task into phases? Um, did they assign roles? Did they have parallel production cycles where one group was working on something while another group worked on something and then they combined them to save time rather than doing them one after the other? These are all things students can consider did they look at, or did they have to look at um, the resources they had? Now there are a range of resources, human resources. In choosing their teams, did they just choose their friends or did they choose based upon the skills needed for the task? Did they choose someone that was good at programming and someone that was good at designing and someone that was good at um, creating a presentation and someone that was a good leader and manager and keep everyone on task? Having a really good effective team and making that selection of the human resources they have available is a really is rarely seen in primary schools. It's more often they choose their friends, mostly because they haven't thought through the advantages of that team selection process and learning about that and being having activity structured to enable that can be a really effective learning opportunity. Likewise, did you set um, resource limits in the materials and tools they had available. If they've only got 20 paddle pop sticks in order to make the bridge to span the gap, they then need to think about, okay, how are we going to use those resources the most effectively, as opposed to just having an unlimited number of um, materials that they could use. You could assign costs to things. Yes, they could use paddle pop sticks. They cost one cent each, and they've got one dollar to spend on the task. Or they could use pieces of spaghetti, which cost, um, well, we probably won't use fractions too much. Let's say the paddle pop sticks cost a dollar and the spaghetti strands cost five cents each. And they can then make decisions. How many paddle pop sticks could we spend and buy with our $10? Or let's, let, let's be generous, let's give them $100. So they could have 100 paddle pop sticks. Or they could have um, 500 strands of spaghetti which is going to be the best for their solution. They could make decisions based upon the limited resources available and the effectiveness of different resources in achieving their solution. You could also then charge them for a cost of using hot glue guns versus um, uh, glue paste um, or staples. And they could then start making budgets and planning out how to utilize various resources in a most effective way. Okay, then there's the use of the, the processes that they go through. Um, did they plan out the time they had available? 
did they make a flow chart of doing things so that they know when they could do things uh, at the same time or when they had to wait until something is done so that they could use that to do the next thing? Did they work out some timelines so that they spent um, 10 minutes on this, this aspect? Then once that was done, they would spend 10 minutes on this aspect and then 10 minutes on this aspect so that they had enough time to get all three elements completed rather than spending three quarters of their time on the first aspect and then only, only having a quarter of the time for the la last two aspects. These are all things that students need to be involved in and ideally involved in the decision making around. The whole concept of deadlines is often foreign to many students, foreign to many teachers too, um, but it's something that students need to learn about and how to meet those deadlines and to work within them to come up with effective solutions. Okay, take another break. We've just explored design and technology in terms of the year five and six um, content descriptors in some detail. Now we're going to next look at digital technologies so that you've got a better understanding of the content descriptors of what needs to be achieved in the digital technology subject. See you in a minute. Okay, well, welcome to digital technologies. And now we're going to look at the content descriptors for digital technologies. So first off, at a foundation level, um, the level descriptors. We looked at the design and technology descriptors before. Um, at the foundation level for the um, for digital technologies, we want students to be able to, again, build upon what they've been learning about in the early years of their learning. So they may have come across uh, mobile phones, and digital various other devices and so forth. We want to give them some experience of computational thinking to allow them to experiment with different ways of approaching ideas and activities using technology, particularly digital technologies. And often that can come down at this level to using various symbols, um, having a the idea that a symbol can represent various things. So for example, a smiley face uh, represents good work and a frowny face represents bad work. Um, a, a smiling sun represents a fine day. A cloud with a frowny face represents a rainy day. These are symbols we use to represent information. Now this then leads us into other things such as using symbols to represent um, numbers in terms of quantity, we might look at how many students are tall or so, let's say how many students have brown hair. One way of recording that is to use ticks, little tick symbols. Another way is to use numbers to count the number. Another is to use little pictures of hair, pictures of brown hair. Um, and then we could compare with pictures of blonde hair or ticks of blonde hair or numbers of blonde hair. Or we could use words to represent that. There were eight students written out in words that had brown hair. These are different ways of representing information using different symbols. And that's one of our initial computational thinking concepts that we introduce into digital technologies at the foundation year level. So we then look at different ways that can be recorded. Uh, I just went through a few of those. So using ticks or images or numbers or writing it out, um, or we could take photos. We could take a photo of each student and put it up on a photo board to represent all the students with brown hair and all the students with blonde hair. So there are a range of different ways that we can um, gather that information together. So through all of this, students will be developing their confidence in using digital systems. So using a digital camera, uh, using a computer maybe to record some information on a spreadsheet. Um, and sending simple messages, such as sending an email message. So in foundation, the, all the digital technologies tasks are going to be, by their nature, foundational, simplified. But they do represent strong conceptual foundations that they're going to build upon as they develop their understanding of digital technologies. So the idea that data can actually exist and that we can own data and that 
there is some data that relates to ourselves that is our own, that we own, such as your password. Um, there might be some data about where you live that you might want to keep private so that only your friends and your family know where you live, but strangers don't know. So these are things that we start exploring the concept of data and information. But some data is more public, such as having a photograph of your school might be public. It's available on the school website. But a photo of you might be just for your parents and for yourself at home. And these are things that are then explored. Now, of course, we want to still make this fun. So we do it again through guided play-based experiences. But these still offer, offer great opportunities to develop systems thinking by looking at how we have various systems to do things. We have various computer systems, uh, physical devices and networks and so forth, such as tablets and smartphones, and they can be used for different purposes. But we also have different systems for going about doing things, such as a system for getting up in the morning and going and brushing our teeth and getting ready for school. That involves a system. Um, we might have a system for working out who, what chores we do at home. And it might change each week. So if we've got some brothers and sisters, um, so that it mixes up who does what. And that's a system that our parents have put in place to give us um, different chores so that it is a fair system. Now, as much as possible, we want to make these different learning activities um, authentic so that they have a reason for learning them. So they're not just learned abstractly. We don't just learn them because that's the lesson for today or because the teacher says we're going to learn them. But we're learning them for a purpose. And often we link that in with other key learning areas or make a project around it and learn it within that contextual environment. OK, into the level descriptors. So for years one and two, um, we focus on describing algorithms. Now, algorithms are a sequence of instructions or decisions that we make. Tying our shoes involves an algorithm. We have to move our hands in various ways to make various loops, and we end up with tied shoelaces. Um, how we make our breakfast involves an algorithm. We get the bowl out, we pour the cornflakes into the bowl, we then pour the milk into the bowl, and then we eat. If we started eating before we poured the cornflakes into the bowl, the system would break down. It wouldn't work. That would be a, a poor algorithm. So an algorithm is simply a set of instructions that we follow. Now, in later years, that algorithm can be more complex, where it can branch, where we make decisions as to doing one thing or another thing. Or sometimes it can be iterative, what's called a loop, where we might do things several times. So an algorithm to brush our teeth is to move our toothbrush up and down. Now, that's a simple sequence, but then we put that within a loop and we do that 20 times. So for 20 times, we move our toothbrush up and down is now a looped algorithm. OK, that's sort of a big part of it. And then the other key aspect in years one and two is that we can represent data in different ways, building upon what we just saw in foundation to go into more detail about how we can represent information and data in digital technologies. Now, there's some strong links to mathematics, particularly in, in recognizing patterns in data um, and identifying common and distinctive patterns, how we can sort data, put things from shortest to tallest, largest to smallest, because that's the same thing, um, things that weigh the least to weigh the most. Um, there's different ways of sorting things. Uh, and we can also look at the distinctive features of different uh, things. So we just look then at um, how much it weighs, how high it is, things of that nature, how old it is. Um, there are various characteristics that we can use that can provide data that we can then use to sort things. And from that, we can then make generalizations, such as things that generally um, weigh a lot uh, or don't weigh very much or things like that. And we look for patterns in the data. And we'll be exploring this as we go through this course. They also have opportunities to develop systems thinking, looking at a whole range of different purposes. We can um, use various digital technologies and 
various sets of data. And we also develop students' skills in how they can use different technologies. Um, they'll learn about using keyboards and touch pads. They'll also learn various programming concepts and approaches. They'll develop various skills in sorting data and identifying patterns in data. And they'll use various software um, to create various solutions, um, to communicate various ideas, to write a message that includes an image, for example, to share it with their classmates. Um, and there are various software tools that they'll learn how to use in addressing these various activities. They'll still use design thinking and the design process, and they'll be also focused on meeting the needs of different people through digital systems in this case, rather than design solutions, um, but very similar processes in any event. They will, though, however, have a strong focus on security of their data, uh, developing an awareness um, of data and how various websites and apps can collect data and store their data, and how sometimes that can be inappropriate. By the end of year six, they should be able to apply computational thinking to create digital solutions through the use of visual programming languages. Now, visual programming languages are the ones that use predominantly icons rather than text. Um, so instead of saying, go to line 10, um, if x equals 5, then print, um, we use little images or pic pictographs, uh, blocks as we call them, uh, which help us structure the program. And also, the, the main advantage is it reduces um, what are called syntax errors, errors in punctuation and language, which are very common when we just use text. Of course, if you put a full stop or a semicolon or um, incorrectly in a text-based programming language, then it won't work. Whereas using pictures, um, as long as you choose the right picture, um, is much more effective. And you're going to learn about block-based programming in as a tutorial exercise. Okay, through all this, um, they'll be developing a range of different strategies for solving problems using digital technologies and developing what's called abstract thinking. And again, we'll be exploring abstract thinking in much greater detail in a couple of weeks. Okay, so they need to be able to represent their algorithms using visual programs. And another good advantage of visual programs are that they provide a nice diagrammatic representation of an algorithm. Text-based programs do the same, but it's much much easier to see the algorithm when it's visually um, depicted. Uh, other than that, we can use flowcharts and other systems to demonstrate uh, the various steps that a process would go through in order to, to achieve a solution. And we don't just use algorithms for digital solutions. We can have an algorithm for how to, as I mentioned before, brush our teeth, um, which could be um, depicted as a flowchart, um, setting out the steps and iterations or decisions that are made in that process. But through all that, we develop students' ability to think more abstractly. Um, and also looking at how we represent data in different ways, particularly on and off data. Um, fundamentally, uh, digital technologies are run off um, digital circuits, which either have electricity flowing through them or not electricity flowing through them. And we represent that in computer language, in a thing called binary, being either zeros, where there's no electricity flowing, or ones, where there is electricity flowing. And that's the basis of digital circuits, or in fact, any circuit, uh, well, digital circuits. Uh, and uh, that it has enabled computers to be very powerful because they can process those zeros and ones very, very quickly. But we'll explore that in more detail later again. They still they use design thinking to generate multiple ideas and choose the solutions that will be best from those ideas. Okay, given um, again, just as with design and technology, we want students to be able to develop criteria in which to judge um, various outcomes in their solutions. And we also want to have what's called student-generated user stories. In design and technology, we talked a little bit about clients and about who would be the end users of the solution. In digital technologies, we often generate those clients abstractly. 
um, we come up with ideas of who they would be and we call those user generated stories. So we make up who the user would be and we describe them and then we come up with a solution to meet their needs. Um, now, ideally, we could probably go and find real clients again in digital technologies, but this is just how the computer industry does things a fair bit. So that's why we tend to use this sort of terminology as opposed to clients and users that we use more of a terminology in, in designer technology. But again, we want students to come up with their own criteria for these solutions as much as possible. Again, it's a learned process. We need to teach students how to be able to do that. Um, and then once they've learned that, then they should have more opportunities to be able to do so. Okay, again, lots of um, opportunities in the mathematics learning area to develop um, elements of statistics and understanding of data. And then in digital technologies, we often focus on creating displays of that data, how we can represent that data in various ways through various visualizations. We also use systems thinking to investigate how that data can be used in various ways and who would use it in different systems that could make benefit or that could benefit from the use of that data. And also look at how that data can be um, shared, transmitted over networks and broken up and um, distributed down and various other technical processes. Okay. Um, and of course, we use projects and group work and activities that students work through. And again, students will come up with agreed conventions and ways of doing so in um, so that they're effective, come up with various charts and um, structures, particularly for managing data. When students collect lots of data, they need to be able to do it in a way so that they can uh, group that data into different ways, putting it in different files and different documents, different spreadsheets, different databases, um, and create hierarchies of that. So you've got um, uh, school A's data and school B data. And then within that, you've got class A in school A, class B in school A, class C in school A, and so forth. So you've got different collections of data and ways of collecting and um, organizing that data. They need to be able to work collaboratively. They need to understand they need to protect their data and that they will have a, that data represents a uh, perspective that others will have on them. And we call that their digital footprint. And then that digital footprint can be permanent. That data, once it's shared, can often be made available then um, throughout their entire lifetime, or indeed after their lifetime. So they need to be careful about what data is shared about them. Okay. Let's get into the um, what they need to be able to demonstrate at the end of years five and six. Sorry, the end of year six. So again, creating digital solutions, um, using that address user stories and design criteria, process data and represent data, design algorithms, and use visual programs that include the use of variables. Again, we'll discuss variables in later weeks. They need to be able to securely access and use multiple digital systems, select and use appropriate tools, plan, create, locate, and share content, collaborate, use agreed conventions and behaviors, and identify their digital footprint and recognize its permanence. For years one and two, again, we're skipping out the years in between. We're already looking at lots of information today. So we're just looking at the um, end of primary and the beginning of primary. They need to meet the needs of a known user, so someone that they can really specifically identify with and understand, represent data in different ways, use basic algorithms that involve a sequence of steps and some decisions, some branching. Uh, with the assistance of the teacher and others, they need to be able to access and use digital systems for a purpose. They need to be able to use common tools, create, locate, and share content, and collaborate using agreed behaviors and recognize again that this, these tools may store their data online and that that may be sometimes inappropriate. They need to be able to be familiar with various digital systems and use them for a purpose. They need to be able to represent data and use objects, pictures, and symbols to um, demonstrate aspects of that data and that some data can be owned by them. Okay. So 
From all of that, we have some specific content descriptors. In foundation, the first of these relate to digital systems. And these are their ability to recognize and explore digital systems, hardware and software for a purpose. So some elaborations on that, again, being optional ways of approaching, addressing that particular content descriptor. We have using a smartphone or a laptop or programmable school and recognizing that they can interact with that. Playing with different digital systems and exploring their purpose. So for example, using uh, speaking to the class using video conferencing. Taking photos, asking permissions of people to take their photos, um, looking at the close-ups of photos and seeing how they, they show more detail. Making a model of a digital system, such as a cardboard robot or cardboard computer and drawing out a keyboard and a screen and putting some app icons on that and um, explaining then how it would work. Next area is data representation, representing data as objects, pictures, and symbols. Um, this fits in very strongly with um, the Hass area of questioning and researching, where they sort and record information, and also in mathematics and statistics, where they collect and sort and compare data. Some of the ways that they can do that, drawing a picture that represents each of their family members, their interests. Um, so for example, holding a surfboard or skateboard using colored blocks to represent um, attributes. So um, number of blue blocks represents the number of students in the blue sporting house. The yellow blocks represents the number of students in the yellow sporting house. And then they can count those blocks and see how many students are in each of the houses. Um, again, just using objects to represent various elements of data. Using various symbols to represent various ideas and things such as different types of flags representing different countries or different communities within a country. Looking at the Aboriginal flag and how the symbols on that represent different things, such as the sun and the land. Looking at privacy and security, and identifying data that's um, personal and owned by them. This again fits in with mathematics and statistics, um, but they could list things that they own that are personal to them their toys, uh, photos of themselves, photos of their parents. These are things that um, relate specifically to them and are private versus things that are more public and um, open to others to utilize. Looking at various apps and websites and how that they can collect information um, and how that they may need to get their parents or carers support to use various um, apps and websites that involve usernames and things of that nature and passwords and okay so that's the foundation year take another bit of a break and then we'll come back and look at digital technologies content descriptors for years five and six okay so let's now look at the content descriptors for Digital technologies, I've got DNT there, but that's why that should be DT, um, for years five and six. So the first of these is digital systems, investigating the main internal components and common digital systems and their functions. Different ways of doing that, um, getting a whole lot of um, devices and looking at how they work. So some tablets and how they might perform various um, computations, looking at a calculator, how it does things. Um, ideally, being able to pull them apart, looking at the chips and various things inside them, looking at how a keyboard works, how a mouse works. These are things that um, can be explored. Looking at the idea of what's called a central processing unit, which is a chip inside a digital device that takes information in, processes it, and sends information out and how they work together to do things. Investigating the various elements of a digital system. So how a video conferencing system works. So how we need a computer, how we need a camera, a microphone, um, a digital modem to transmit the information. These are things that form a system 
that allow us to do things using digital technologies. Then going into more detail about how digital systems form networks and transmit data between these networks. Looking at how we can connect various computers together and how they can transmit information. How sometimes that can be transmitted by cables, how sometimes it can be transmitted by um, over the air through um, radio waves or through um, microwaves or through satellites. There are different ways that we can transmit information um, to allow a network to form. There are various ways we can structure this information so that it can be transmitted more efficiently. And generally, we break things down into small pieces, which are called packets. So we don't send an entire picture in one big um, bit of data. We break it down into thousands and thousands of small little packets and each of those are sent off with an address bit of information that tells us where to where it's to go. And it's sent off through various nodes in our network, and it eventually gets to the other end, and it's then put together. All these little packets are again then put together. Now, there are various activities that we're going to be exploring in this course that allow you to teach this. I understand that it's probably new to many of you, and some of this starts sounding, it's probably starting to sound a little bit scary. Don't worry, there are lots of activities that are already existing now, um, video clips, games, um, projects, and just general activities that students can use to learn about these concepts. They're all, really, they're all relatively simple concepts. I know they're starting to sound quite complex, and at their highest levels, they can be complex. But at the level we're talking about in primary school, they're not particularly com complex and you'll have no problems teaching them and students learning about them when you examine the resources and explore them in, in detail. Just looking at them in abstraction as we are now, um, I can see how they would be worrying. But don't worry, they'll start making much more sense when we start looking at all the resources and activities that you'll be able to use with your students. Investigating how satellite phones and mobile phones work and when they're what, and when and why, sometimes you have areas when they, but, but they don't work, when the data network is inaccessible. Oops. Next bit is around data representation, how we can represent data using numbers. So various processes such as sending coded messages based upon their position in an alphabet and doing little simple code activities is a common approach to teaching this. Um, how we can change things by adding numbers and performing um, calculations on data that allows us to do different things. Whereas adding letters together um, is not as flexible. If we put a whole series of numbers together, we can do averages, we can do um, means, we can do um, highest, highest and lowest numbers these sorts of things. When we put letters together, we don't have as many options to, to manipulate that data and to do statistical work with it. So that's why often we translate data into numbers so that we can do more things with it. And we call that statistics. How we can represent data um, with on and off states. We we're talking a bit about four zeros and ones in binary. Um, we can make beads which represent zeros and ones, on or off, based upon their color. And we can then encode various messages using the binary coding language, which again, we'll explore, um, to be able to make a bead, um, a bead message. Uh, and that can relate to some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, approaches to what we call a binary banner. Okay, we can look at how digital circuits work with zeros and ones representing um, the state of electricity flow within a circuit, relating back to what students are learning in design and technology around circuits with light bulbs and so forth. We can then use the light bulbs to represent on and off states, which can represent digital messages and instructions. And how these on and off states can be used to transit information. Um, we can use things such as Morse code and there's various other um, coding systems, such as semaphore, 
um, sign language, various other ways we can encode information other than just using numbers or letters. Then we have the processes. Just like with design technology, we've got our knowledge and understanding, and then we have our processes and um, production, yep, the processes aspect. Now we look at the first of these, which is um, investigating and defining. So some examples here, given some stimulus, identify an issue, and then writing a user story. Talked a bit about this before. Coming up with a user who's going to use the solution that we're going to de develop for them. Um, so for example, a family living in a bushfire prone area, and they want to have a system to be able to be informed when there might be a bushfire coming and how we come up with a digital system that could achieve that. But we create the story about the user that sets the context for our solution. Um, looking at various design criteria, and just as we did so in design technology, assigning various costs and timeframes and constraints around that, we can do so in coming up with our solutions for digital technologies. Looking at the impact of our solutions, um, how we could investigate how, in this case, the impact of others. So we could have some sort of digital system to count um, feral animals and count the number of native animals and using that information then to make a better understanding of the impact of feral animals upon native animals. Then we generate and design solutions. And again, come up with several solutions so that students can choose from and decide upon which is the best to then implement. Designing an algorithm to modify an existing algorithm. So for example, let's say we have one that looks at measuring the um, amount of moisture in the garden. Um, and it might only take that measurement once a day at midnight. Whereas a better algorithm might be to take measurements um, every hour and create an average of those measurements. Of course, the measurement of amount of moisture might be very much impacted at midnight based upon how hot it's been during the day. Um, whereas one early in the morning might have had the advantage of having dew form and moisture come into the soil in that way. So again, looking at the algorithm and ways it can be improved upon. Creating steps and decisions and loops in an algorithm and understanding what they're for. So for example, uh, repeating various steps um, through the use of loops to make things more efficient. Um, so say, for example, if you're going to have to do a lot of counting. Um, again, we're going to explore this in more detail when we look at some of the activities uh, related to um, algorithms. OK, constructing more than one sequence of steps to solve a problem and explaining why one is better than the other. And with algorithms, that can be, often be done mathematically. We can actually work out how many steps one algorithm would take um, versus another. So for example, making a way through a maze, how many different decisions are going to be needed using one algorithm versus how many decision steps of choosing which way to go will be taken using another algorithm. Or we could just make a robot or digital device to move through the algorithm and time how long it takes. Um, OK, and again, this process, and as we look at programming languages in more detail, these will make more sense. But looking at how different um, ways of doing a algorithm, um, using if then, or then ifs, and, and, and else statements and so forth, can be more efficient than others. OK, and then we can again look at different ways of algorithms stopping. We can use loops, but loops that go on forever can cause problems. So often we have what are called conditionals that's, that cause a loop to, to stop. And there are different ways of structuring things to make that more efficient than others. Um, a good example is a loop that says, keep running until um, you're no longer um, on this 
um, keep running until you go over the cliff and then stop versus keep running until you detect the edge of the cliff and then stop. Um, if you've got one, you're the coyote and you run over the cliff and you fall down. If you do the other algorithm, you run along until you reach the edge of the cliff, you stop and you're the roadrunner and you stop and you get to look at the coyote falling down over the cliff. Um, so there are various ways of structuring an algorithm that will produce a better solution than others. Uh, designing algorithms to look at data and how we can then say count things and um, make different choices and so forth. Then we generate and design our solutions. Um, again, lots of different ways of coming up with our algorithms, drawing them out on paper, using various digital tools to create flowcharts or um, block-based programming languages to set out that. And this example is coming up with a better system of ordering lunches for a canteen. Using different user interfaces, making the user interface easier for people to use, making the font larger, uh, more contrast so that people can identify what to do when they use a digital tool more effectively, particularly for those that have disabilities. Um, how we can have it so people from different languages can do different things in different ways. Understand how people access information differently. Um, in some languages, people read from right to left. Others, they read from left to right. How that might impact upon how we design our different interfaces to digital um, solutions. Then we generate and design our solution. Again, various different approaches for doing this, coming up with a whole range of different ways of doing it, and then coming up with um, a decision around which is best in relation to the user story that's been constructed or who is going to use the solution. Um, suggesting various modifications to existing solutions, looking, say, at a range of different computer games or computer game controllers and suggesting improvements upon those. So students don't necessarily have to make their own solution from scratch, they can look at existing solutions and come up with better modifications to those. Then, of course, they produce and implement their solution, um, writing programs and coming up with databases and creating various um, outcomes. Um, in this case, using uh, drawing various circles, using various iterations to make uh, patterns and coming up with an interactive quiz that allows students to um, learn things more effectively. And again, I'll let you read through these. These are all start coming a little bit more um, abstract um, until you've learned more about programming. But in this case, it's using um, a computer program to move an object around a computer screen, making a little game this case, moving a cat around and changing how it moves and knowing that we can push certain keys that will change its location based upon coordinates. So it'll, it'll decrease or increase the coordinate values based upon key strokes. And again, you'll be making similar activities in the tutorials. Automating tasks such as closing gates, we talked about in design technology, then evaluating our solutions against various criteria. Ideally, students coming up with their own criteria, ensuring that it meets the needs of the user stories that they've identified, um, ensuring that these things happen safely um, and that there's no inappropriate data collection, so we only collect data when we need to. Uh, reflecting on the different ways we could have gone about creating the solution and how the process could have been improved upon. Then collaborating and managing how we can work in teams more effectively, how we can use digital tools to um, plan out that teamwork, um, creating reports and infographics and things of that nature to demonstrate our solutions, uh, being able to locate information and search for that information more effectively, creating um, content that can be used for feedback and improved upon so that when we make our 
solutions? How can we then improve upon those solutions and make them better? Um, in this case, planning out a school celebration by creating a spreadsheet that gathers information about what people want to have happen at the celebration and using that as a planning process to improve the celebration as an outcome. Another aspect of collaborating and managing is using various tools to improve the process, um, creating a plan and reporting back on the processes of how that plan is, is being enacted. So for example, creating a new skate park for the local government and presenting that as a plan to the local government. Um, collecting data and knowing when it's appropriate to collect data and when it's not, when to destroy that data and respecting other people's data and their intellectual property. Um, managing that data, naming things, organizing things, storing things, um, making backups, all the rest that goes into um, effectively managing data. Working through agreed behaviors and understanding the risks, particularly around privacy and potential impact of their solutions on others. Communicating in various ways their solutions and the processes they're going about in creating them. For example, creating an online form to collect data from other students or from the community. And then that comes to privacy and security. So students are going to be maintaining multiple personal accounts and using unique passphrases and explaining the risks of password use and reuse. Um, understanding when passwords are risky and why we need to change them and how to structure them so that they can be um, as secure as possible. And the idea of their digital footprint and how we can make that as um, appropriate as possible when it is necessary to have a digital footprint um, and how to make it so that it's going to remain an appropriate digital footprint um, throughout their lifetime. And how to secure data online to protect it from being stolen in cyber attacks. Okay, lots of information again this week. But one last section to go through, and that is scope and sequences. So again, take a quick break and then we'll come back and explore that. OK, scope and sequences. These represent the ways we plan out how to address all of this content descriptors so that we achieve the um, outcomes at each of the year bands that are expected and meet the expectations of the curriculum. Now, they tend to focus on the content descriptors. And this is a bit of a danger. Of course, as we saw last week, the curriculum is broader than just the content descriptors. We still want to achieve the overarching thinking skills and aims and outcomes of the curriculum. But for planning purposes, we have to structure things down. And at the moment, the curriculum is framed very much around these small itemized content descriptors with the assumption that by achieving them, students will be moving forward in developing their thinking skills and the larger aims and outcomes of the curriculum. So in general, there is suggested times for teaching of each of the learning areas. And for the technologies learning area, combining both digital and design and technology, it is generally expected that students will spend around about 30 minutes a week in years foundation through to years two. Now, this equates to about 60 hours a year. So not a, sorry, 60 hours over the three years. Um, so not a huge amount of time, but it's a reasonable amount. 30 minutes a week is on par with how much time students would often spend in subjects such as geography and health and PE, things of that. And these number of hours increase as we go up the year levels. In years three and four, Generally, it's about an hour a week or 80 hours a year. And in years five and six, one and a half hours a week or 120 hours a year. Now, some schools will allocate more time. Um, schools have around about 50% of the available time to their discretionary allocation to subject areas. Now, literacy and numeracy 
to maths and English tend to get the bulk of it. Of course, that's a priority area in schools and has been for a number of years. Um, but some schools decide to have a focus on technologies, particularly often digital technologies, and they will allocate more time in that space. Other schools, particularly in um, disadvantaged areas, might have a very strong vocational focus, and they may allocate more time for designer technology. But in general, roughly about the same amount of time is allocated to both subjects, at least that's certainly the expectation. And within that, within the bands, schools have got their own discretion as to how much time they spend on the different learning areas. For example, they might spend their entire hour, um, say 80 hours, in just years three and not do any technologies in year four. Now, ideally that wouldn't happen. Um, the curriculum is somewhat designed to be done evenly um, throughout each of the years in each of the bands. Um, but it is certainly possible for schools to structure things in different ways. So within that, they then need to choose from all of those content descriptors and elaborations um, how they're going to address things. They have to address all of the content descriptors for each of the bands within the two-year band. But how they do that and what order is up to them. And how much time they spend on them is up to them. And then we call that a scope and sequence. So it's a planning document that works out in what order various things are going to be addressed and generally describes the activities that students would be doing, somewhat like the elaborations. Now, there are some common approaches to doing this. While each school, in theory, can do whatever they want, um, various se sectors have developed resources to assist. In Queensland, we have what's called the C2C uh, materials, curriculum into the classroom, um, developed for our state school system. And many state schools do utilize this. Now, it was designed when the curriculum was first introduced, when teachers had no real understanding of the curriculum and needed a lot of support to develop their own scope and sequences. So it provided a base level set of activities and scope and sequence to allow all schools and all teachers to be able to address the curriculum. Um, the intention though is that uh, as teachers master that, they would then come up with their own unique ways of doing things that suit their particular students, the particular school, the resources they have available, the skill sets of their teachers, the interests of their students, and all the rest that makes uh, school-based decisions so important in developing effective curriculum. But that said, many schools have still stayed with using the C2C material. Of course, it's convenient and it sets a baseline and essentially reduces the amount of work they have to do. Of course, developing your own material does take time. But the C2C material is relatively minimalistic. It's not bad, but it doesn't necessarily meet the unique needs of particular circumstances. But if there's nothing else, it provides a good framework. Now, unfortunately, it's only really available to our state schools. Um, it can be accessed through a set of resources called Scoodle, which is a national repository, which I'll talk about later in the course. But um, it's generally fairly restricted. There is another set of resources that has been developed by the federal government and placed in what's called the Digital Technologies Hub, which is a national repository of resources for teaching digital technologies. Um, and we're going to be using that fairly extensively in this course. Of course, it provides lots of really good activities that you can then utilize in coming up with your own activities and lessons. And of course, you have your own digital technologies lesson plan to develop for your assessment. Now, this is an example of the C2C scope and, sorry, the Digital Technologies Hub scope and sequence. Um, it covers F to 10, but for this course, we're only focusing on F to um, 6. And it is for the previous version of the curriculum at the moment, um, version 9, sorry, version 8 or 8.6, whatever it was. Um, in this course, we're focusing on version 9, uh, but not all organizations have caught up with in, um, modifying their mat materials to come up to version 9 standard. 
Um, but that said, 98% of the curriculum is exactly the same. There's just a few changes in headings and emphasis and different elements. Um, but you can still utilize much of the resources and use them as ideas. By the time you get out into schools, they'll no doubt have updated things and have version 9 scope and sequence and the, the associated learning activities that will go with that. So I encourage you to explore the Digital Technologies Hub. We're going to be using it during this course quite a bit. Um, and it will help you if you start your exploration. And a good place to start is with the scope and sequence. It provides a structure for oops, each of the um, contexts and activities, only for digital technologies, unfortunately. But it then goes through and provides you with activities that support each of those. So it's a great way of learning about how to address many of the digital technologies concepts. And as we saw, some of them sound a bit strange, all this stuff about binary and looping and iterations and branching. And as you start looking at the activities, things will become much clearer to you as to how simple the ideas are and how easy it will be to teach and how you get the concepts across to your students. Now that said, schools though can choose their own scope and sequences. And many schools have created their own. Um, and you can go onto the internet and do some searches for scope and sequence, or just search for digital technologies in primary school, say Queensland, and you'll come up with a whole range of schools that have published on their website, their various approaches to teaching um, all of the learning areas. And you can see how they've structured um, teaching the technologies learning area and the various activities that they do in addressing that. And to assist the curriculum documents themselves provide um, links to what's called the related content. Of course, when you develop scope and sequences, it's normally done as a whole school planning activity. And you do that for all the subject areas. So it becomes much more complex than just the technologies as we've been looking at today. So when you do it for all the learning areas, it gets far more complex. But the big advantage of doing that is you start seeing where things can be taught together. And as we talked about that before, teaching about electronics in both science and design and technology, and also in digital technologies. And we call that related content in the curriculum. And the curriculum is now starting to show some strong linkages between those. And we use that when we do these planning activities of developing scope and sequences. Um, and normally they're done at the end of each year, at the very beginning of each year. Um, and it provides a framework then for how the different activities will be done throughout the year to address all of the curriculum areas. OK, so that's been an exploration of the content of the technologies learning area, both design and technology and digital technologies, where we've looked at the descriptors um, in terms of the content descriptors, we've looked at the outcomes that are expected at the end of each of the bands, and we've looked at the scope and sequences that we can use to organize all of these content descriptors so they start making some sort of structured sense, um, which will then lead us into the activities that we use to actually teach these content descriptors. And we'll be excited to explore those um, next week when we start looking at pedagogy. But this week, we now have got some tutorial activities for you to do to help understand these content descriptors in a bit more detail. Now, the first is a digital technologies activity. And again, I'd like you to have this done before your tutorial so that you can discuss it in the tutorial. Now, you're going to do what's called an hour of code activity. Now, it won't take you anywhere near an hour. Um, most of them can be done in probably 10 to 20 minutes. Um, but there are a series of little activities that you work through that will teach you some basic concepts in programming. So you're going to learn computer programming. At most, it will take you an hour. Um, and it certainly probably wouldn't take anywhere near that amount of time. And it's often the first step we use in similar block-based programming activities with our students. Now, on the Hour of Code website, um, which is hourofcode.com, you'll see a, a range of different contexts that you can do your Hour of Code in. If you're interested in Star Wars, there's a Star Wars Hour of Code um, set of activities. If you're interested in the movie Frozen, there's one for that. And they're all themed around various contexts. 
If you're interested in the Angry Birds computer game, there's a set of ones for that. So you choose a one of the arrow codes, and then um, oops, at the end of that, you'll go through a series of activities, generally about half a dozen to a dozen little activities that often just mo involve moving an object around a screen with some block-based coding. And at the end of that, for the, in the final activity, take a screenshot of that and then share that to both Learning at Griffith and to Microsoft Teams as evidence of you having completed that particular activity. And then in tutorials, you'll discuss that with your tutors. OK, then in the tutorial itself, you're going to be learning around 3D modeling, um, creating three-dimensional models of various objects. Now, for the online students, you'll be doing that using um, some three-dimensional CAD programs, computer-aided design, so making three-dimensional objects on a computer. For those on campus, you're going to be doing some 3D printing. Now, unfortunately, 3D printers take a long time um, to actually print out using a 3D printer. They can create wonderful objects. And many schools do have 3D printers now. But when they take 20 minutes or so to create a simple, a, a simple object, having a, a group of students, 30 students, all wanting to create an object takes a long time. So they involve a lot of planning and processing. Some schools have dozens of printers now, and so they're able to cope with that. But we're going to be using a somewhat different technology. We're going to be using um, 3D printing pens. So they're a little bit like a hot glue gun, where they extrude plastic instead of glue. And you're going to be using that to create little 3D animals. Um, and there'll be some instructions on the course website that will lead you through how to use the pen and how to create these 3D animals. For the online students, you're going to be using um, some CAD programs, um, using Tinkercad, which everyone's going to be using eventually because we use it for a number of different activities. And you're going to be coming up with your own ideal playground. Using the basic shapes in Tinkercad, you'll be able to place um, blocks and cones and circles and spheres and things. You're going to be using that to design and model a playground. And your tutors will help you through that process in the tutorials. And as always, you'll then share some screenshots or photos of your um, final product to both Microsoft Teams and Learning at Griffith to count towards your um, log of learning activities. So that's it for this week. Next week, we're going to be exploring pedagogy, the approaches we take to teaching um, the technologies learning area. Uh, that's it for content this week. And I hope you enjoyed the tutorials.